Chapter One of Hearts of Controversy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hearts of Controversy by Alice Maynell. Chapter Some Thoughts of a Reader of Tennyson. Fifty years after Tennyson's birth, he was saluted a great poet by that unanimous acclamation which includes mere clamour. Fifty further years and his centenary was marked by a new detraction. It is sometimes difficult to distinguish the obscure but not unmajestic law of change from the sorry custom of reaction. Change hastes not and rests not. Reaction beats to and fro, flickering about the moving mind of the world. Reaction the paltry precipitancy of the multitude, rather than the novelty of change, has brought about the ferment and corruption of opinion on Tennyson's poetry. It may be said that opinion is the same now as it was in the middle of the nineteenth century, the same but turned. All that was not worth having of admiration then has soured into detraction now. It is of no more significance acrid than it was sweet. What the herding of opinion gave yesterday it is able to take away today, that and no more. But besides the common favour disfavour of the day, there is the tendency of educated opinion, once disposed to accept the whole of Tennyson's poetry, as though he could not be parted from himself, and now disposed to reject the whole on the same plea. But if there ever was a poet who needed to be thus parted, the word is his own. It is he who wrote both narrowly for his time and liberally for all time, and who, this is the more important character of his poetry, had both a style and a manner, a masterly style, a magical style, a too dainty manner, nearly a trick, a noble landscape, and in it figures something ready-made. He is a subject of our alternatives of feeling, nay, our conflicts, as is hardly another poet. We may deeply admire and wonder, and, in another line or hemistage, grow indifferent or slightly averse. He sheds the luminous suns of dreams upon men and women who would do well with footlights, waters the way with rushing streams of paradise and cataracts from visionary hills, laps them in divine darkness, leads them into those touching landscapes, the lovely that are not beloved. Long grey fields cool sombre summers, and meadows thronge with unnoticeable flowers. Speeds his carpet night, or is that hardly a just name for one whose sword smites so well? Upon a carpet of authentic wild flowers, pushes his rovers in costume from off blossoming shores on the keels of old romance. The style and the manner, I have said, run side by side. We may take one poet's too violent phrase and consider poets to be damned to poetry. Why, then, Tennyson is condemned by a couple of sentences to run concurrently. We have the style and the manner locked together at times in a single stanza, locked and yet not mingled. There should be no danger for the more judicious reader, lest impatience at the peculiar Tennyson trick should involve the great Tennyson style in a sweep of protest. Yet the danger has, in fact, proved real within the present and recent years, and seems about to threaten still more among the less judicious. But it will not long prevail. The vigorous little nation of lovers of poetry, alive one by one within the vague multitude of the nation of England, cannot remain finally insensible to what is at once majestic and magical in Tennyson, for those are not qualities they neglect in their other masters. How, valuing singleness of heart in the sixteenth century, splendour in the seventeenth, composure in the eighteenth, how, with a spiritual ear for the note, commonly called Celtic, albeit is the most English thing in the world, the wild would know of the remoter song, how, with the educated sense of style, the liberal sense of ease, how, in a word, fostering letters and loving nature, shall that choice nation within England long disregard these virtues in the nineteenth-century master. 
how disregard him for more than the few years of reaction for the insignificant reasons of his bygone taste his insipid courtliness his prettiness or what not it is no dishonour to tennyson for it is a dishonour to our education to disparage a poet who wrote but the two had he written no more of their kind lines of the passing of arthur of which before i quote them i will permit myself the personal remembrance of a great contemporary author's opinion mr meredith speaking to me of the high-water mark of english style in poetry and prose cited those lines as topmost in poetry on one side lay the ocean and no one lay a great water and the moon was full here is no taint of manner no pretty posture or habit but the simplicity of poetry and the simplicity of nature something on the yonder side of imagery it is to be noted that this noble passage is from tennyson's generally weakest kind of work blank verse and should thus be a sign that the laxity of so many parts of the ideals and other blank verse poems was quite unnecessary fault lax this form of poetry undoubtedly is with tennyson his blank verse is often too easy it cannot be said to fly for the paradoxical reason that it has no weight it slips by without halting or tripping indeed but also without the friction of movement of vitality this quality which is so near to a fault this quality of ease has come to be disregarded in our day that horace walpole overfries this virtue is not good reason that we should hold it for a vice yet we do more than undervalue it and several of our authors in prose and poetry seem to find much merit in the manifest difficulty they will not have a key to turn though closely and tightly in oiled wards they let the reluctant iron catch and grind or they would even prefer to pick you the lock but though we may think it time that the quality once overpriced should be restored to a more proportionate honour our great poet tennyson shows us that of all merits ease is unexpectedly enough the most dangerous it is not only with him that the wards are oiled it is also that the key turns loosely this is true of much of the beautiful idols but not of their best passages nor of such magnificent heroic verse as that of the close of a vision of sin or of lucretius as to the question of ease we cannot have a better maxim than coventry patmore saying that poetry should confess but not suffer from its difficulties and we could hardly find a more curious example of the present love of verse that not only confesses but brags of difficulties and not only suffers from them but cries out under the suffering and shows us the grimace of the pain of it than i have lighted upon in a critical article of a recent quarterly reviewing the book of a poet who manifestly has an insuperable difficulty in hacking his work into ten syllable blocks and keeping at the same time any show of respect for the national grammar the critic gravely invites his reader to note the phrase neath cliffs apparently for beneath the cliffs as characteristic shall the reader indeed note such a matter truly he has other things to do this is by the way tennyson is always an artist and the finish of his work is one of the principal notes of his versification how this finish comports with the excessive ease of his prosody remains his own peculiar secret ease in him does not mean that he has any unhandsome slovenly ways on the contrary he resembles rather the warrior with the pouncet box it is the man of neath cliffs who will not be at the trouble of making a place for so much as a definite article tennyson certainly worked and the exceeding ease of his blank verse comes perhaps of this little paradox that he makes somewhat too much show of the hiding of his art in the first place the poet with the great welcome style and the little unwelcome manner tennyson is in the second place the modern poet who withstood france that is of course modern france france since the renaissance 
From medieval province there is not an English poet who does not own inheritance. It was sometime about the date of the Restoration that modern France began to be modish in England. A ruffle at the court of Charles, a couplet in the ear of the Pope, a tour de phrase from Madame Sévigné, much to the taste of Walpole. Later, the good example of French painting, rich interest paid for the loan of our constable's initiative. Later still, a scattering of French taste, French critical business, over all the shallow places of our literature. These have all been phases of a national vanity of ours, an eager and anxious fluttering or jostling to be foremost and French. Matthew Arnold's essay on criticism fostered this anxiety, and yet I find in this work of his a lack of easy French knowledge, such as his misunderstanding of the word brutalité, which means no more or little more than roughness. Matthew Arnold, by the way, knew so little of French character as to be altogether ignorant of French provincialism, French practical sense, and French convenience. Convenience is his dearest word of content, practical sense his next dearest, and he throws them a score of times in the teeth of the English. Strange is the irony of the truth, for he bestows those withering words on the nation that has the fifty religions and attributes ideas as the antithesis of convenience and practical sense to the nation that has the fifty sources. And not for a moment does he suspect himself of this blunder, so manifest as to be disconcerting to his reader. One seems to hear an incurably English accent in all this, which indeed is reported by his acquaintance of Matthew Arnold's actual speaking of French. It is certain that he has not the interest of familiarity with the language, but only the interest of strangeness. Now, while we meet the effect of the French coat in our 17th century, of the French light verse in our earlier 18th century, and of French philosophy in our later, of the French Revolution in our Wordsworth, of the French painting in our 19th century studios, of French fiction, and the dregs are still running in our libraries, of French poetry in our Swimban, of French criticism in our Arnold, Tennyson shows the effect of nothing French whatever. Not the Elizabethans, not Shakespeare, not Jeremy Taylor, not Milton, not Shelley were, in their art, not their matter, more insular in their time. France, by the way, has more than appreciated the homage of Tennyson's contemporaries. Victor Hugo avers in Le Miserable that our people imitate his people in all things, and, in particular, he rouses in us a delighted laughter of surprise by asserting that the London street boy imitates the Parisian street boy. There is, in fact, something of a street boy in some of our late, more literary mimicries. We are apt to judge a poet too exclusively by his imagery. Tennyson is hardly a great master of imagery. He has more imagination than imagery. He sees the thing with so luminous a mind's eye that it is sufficient to him. He needs not see it more beautifully by a similitude. A clear walled city is enough. Meadows are enough. Indeed, Tennyson reigns forever over all meadows. The happy birds that change their sky. Bright phosphor fresher for the night. Twilight and evening bell. The stillness of the central sea. That friend of mine who lives in God. The solitary morning. Four grey walls and four grey towers. Watched by weeping queens. These are enough. Illustrious and needing not illustration. If we do not see Tennyson to be the lonely, the first, the one that he is, this is because of the throng of his following, though a number that are of that throng hardly know, or else would deny their flocking. But he added to our literature not only in the way of accumulation, but by the advent of his single genius. He is one of the few fountainhead poets of the world. The new landscape which was his, the lovely unbeloved, is, it need hardly be said, the matter of his poetry and not its inspiration. It may have seemed to some readers that it is the novelty in poetry 
of this homely and scenic scenery, this Lincolnshire quality, that accounts for Tennyson's freshness of vision. But it is not so. Tennyson is fresh also in scenic scenery. He is fresh with the things that others have outworn. Mountains, desert islands, castles, elves, what have you that is conventional? Where are there more divine poetic lines than those which will never be wearier with quotation beginning a splendour falls? What castle walls have stood in such light of old romance? Where, in all poetry, is there a sound wilder than that of those faint horns of elfland? Here is the remoteness, the beyond, the light delirium, not of disease, but of more rapturous and delicate health, the closer secret of poetry. This most English of modern poets has been taunted with his mere gardens. He loved, indeed, the lazy lilies of the exquisite garden of the gardener's daughter, but he betook his ecstatic English spirit also far afield and overseas to the winter place of his familiar nightingale. When the first liquid note beloved of men comes flying over many a windy wave, to the lotus eater's shore, to the outland landscape of the palace of art, the clear walled city by the sea, the pillared town, the full-fed river, to the penciled valleys of Monte Rosa, to the vale in Ida, to that tremendous upland in the vision of sin. At last I heard a voice upon the slope, Cry to the summit, is there any hope? To which an answer pealed from that high land, But in a tongue no man could understand. The Cleopatra of the dream of fair women Is but a ready-made Cleopatra, But when in the shade of her forest she remembers the sun of the world, she leaves the page of Tennyson's poorest manner and becomes one with Shakespeare's queen. We drank the Libyan sun to sleep. Nay, there is never a passage of manner, but a great passage of style rebukes our dislike and recalls our heart again. The dramas less than the lyrics, and even less than the ideals, are matter for the true Tennysonian. Their action is, at its liveliest, rather vivacious than vital, and the sentiment, whether in Beckett or in Harold, is not only modern, it is fixed within Tennyson's own peculiar score or so of years. But that he might have answered in drama, to a stronger stimulus, a sharper spur, than his time administered, may be guessed from a few passages of Queen Mary, and from the dramatic terror of the arrow in Harold. The line has appeared in prophetic fragments in earlier scenes, and at the moment of doom it is the outcry of unquestionable tragedy. Sanjlak, Sanjlak, the arrow, the arrow, away. Tennyson is also an eminently all-intelligible poet. Those whom he puzzles or confounds must be a flock with an incalculable liability to go wide of any road, down all manner of streets, as the desperate drover cries in the anecdote. But what are streets, however various, to the ways of error that a great flock will take in open country, minutely, individually wrong, making mistakes upon hardly perceptible occasions, or none, minute fortuitous variations in any possible direction, as used to be said in exposition of the Darwinian theory. A vast outlying public, like that of Tennyson, may make you as many blunders as it has heads, but the accurate clear poet proved his meaning to all accurate perceptions. Where he hesitates, he is the sincere pause of process and uncertainty. It has been said that Tennyson, midway between the student of material science and the mystic, wrote and thought according to an age that wavered with him between the two minds and that men have now taken one way or the other. Is this indeed true, and are men so divided and so sure? Or have they not rather already turned, in numbers, back to the parting or meeting of eternal roads? The religious question that arises upon experience of death has never been asked with more sincerity and attention than by him. 
if in memoriam represents the mind of yesterday it represents no less the mind of tomorrow it is true that pessimism and insurrection in their ignobler forms nay in the ignoblest form of fashion have or had but yesterday the control of the popular pen trivial pessimism or trivial optimism it matters little which prevails for those who follow the one habit today would have followed the other in a past generation fleeting as they are it cannot be within their competence to neglect or reject the philosophy of in memoriam to the dainty stanzas of that poem it is true no great struggle of reasoning was to be committed nor would any such dispute be judiciously entrusted to the rhymes of a song of sorrow Tennyson here proposes rather than closes with the ultimate question of our destiny the conflict for which he has proved himself strong enough is in that magnificent poem of a thinker lucretius but so far as in memorian attends weighs falters and confides it is true to the experience of human anguish and intellect i say intellect advisedly not for him such blunders of thought as coleridge's in the ancient marina or wordsworth in hartlip well coleridge names the sun moon and stars as when in a dream the sleeping imagination is threatened with some significant illness we see them in his poem as apparitions coleridge's senses are infinitely and transcendently spiritual but a candid reader must be permitted to think the mere story silly the wedding guest might rise tomorrow morn a sadder but he assuredly did not rise a wiser man as for wordsworth the most beautiful stanzas of hartley well are fatally rebuked by the truths of nature he shows us the ruins of an aspen wood a blighted hollow a dreary place forlorn because an innocent stag hunted had there broken his heart in a leap from the rocks above grass would not grow there this beast not unobserved by nature fell his death was mourned by sympathy divine and the signs of that sympathy are cruelly asserted by the poet to be these woodland ruins cruelly because the daily sight of the world blossoming over the agonies of beast and bird is made less tolerable to us by such fiction the being that is in the clouds and air maintains a deep and reverential care for the unoffending creature whom he loves the poet offers us a proof of that reverential care the visible alteration of nature at the scene of suffering an alteration we have to disperse with every day we pass in the woods. We are tempted to ask whether Wordsworth himself believed in the sympathy he asked us, on such grounds, to believe in. Did he think his fate to be worthy of no more than a fictitious sign and a false proof? Nowhere in the whole of Tennyson's thought is there such an attack upon our reason and our heart. He is more serious than the solemn Wordsworth in memoriam with all else denison wrote tudors with here and there a subtle word this nature-loving nation to perceive land light sky and ocean as he perceived to this we return upon this we dwell he has been to us firstly the poet of two geniuses a small and an immense secondly the modern poet who answered in the negative that most significant modern question french or not french but he was before the outset of all our study of him of all our love of him the poet of landscape and this he is more clearly than a pen can describe him this eternal character of his is keen in the verse that is winged to meet the homeward ship with her dewy decks and in the sudden island landscape the clover sword that takes the sunshine and the rains or where the kneeling hamlet drains the chalice of the grapes of god it is poignant in the garden night a breeze began to tremble o'er the large leaves of the sycamore and gathering freshly overhead rocked the full foliage elm and swung the heavy folded rose and flung 
the lilies to and fro and said, The dawn, the dawn, and died away. His are the exalted senses that sensual poets know nothing of. I think the sense of hearing, as well as the sense of sight, has never been more greatly exalted than by Tennyson. As from beyond the limit of the world, like the last echo born of a great cry, as to this garden character so much decried, I confess that the lawn does not generally delight me, the word nor the thing. But in Tennyson's page the word is wonderful, as though it had never been dull, the mountain law was dewy dark. It is not that he brings the mountains too near or ranks them in his own peculiar garden plot, but that the word withdraws, withdraws the summit, withdraws into dreams. The lawn is aloft, alone, and as wild as ancient snow. It is the same with many another word or phrase change by passing into his vocabulary, into something rich and strange. His own especially is the March month, his roaring moon. His is the spirit of the dawning month of flowers and storms. The golden soft names of daffodil and crocus are caught by the gale as you speak them in his verse in a fine disproportion with the energy and gloom. His was a new apprehension of nature, an increase in the number, and not only in the sum, of our national apprehension of poetry in nature. Unaware of a separate angel of modern poetry is he who is insensible to the Tennyson note, the note that we reaffirm even with the notes of Vaughan, Traherne, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Blake well in our ears, the Tennyson note of splendour all distinct. He showed us the perpetually transfigured landscape in transfiguring words. He is the captain of our dreams. Others have lighted a candle in England. He lit the sun. Through him our daily suns, and also the backwards and historic suns long since set, which he did not sing, are magnified and he bestows upon us an exalted retrospection. Through him, Napoleon, son of Austerlitz, rises for us with a more brilliant menace upon arms and the plain. Through him, Fielding's most melancholy son lights the dying man to the setting forth on that last voyage of his with such an immortal gleam, denying hope, as would not have lighted for us the memory of that seaward morning had our poetry not undergone the illumination, the transcendent vision of Tennyson's genius. Emerson knew that the poet speaks adequately then, only when he speaks a little wildly, or with the flower of the mind. Tennyson, the clearest headed of poets, is our wild poet. Wild, notwithstanding that little foppery we know of in him, that walking delicately like a gage, wild, notwithstanding the work, the ease, the neatness, the finish, notwithstanding the assertion of manliness which, in asserting, somewhat misses that mark, a wilder poet than the rough, than the sensual, than the defiant, than the accursed, than the denouncer. Wild flowers are his, great poet, wild winds, wild lights, wild heart, Wild Eyes End of chapter 1、chapter、two of Hearts of Controversy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon Hearts of Controversy by Alice Maynell Dickens as a man of letters. It was said for many years, until the reversal that now befalls the sayings of many years had happened to this also, that Thackeray was the unkind satirist and Dickens the kind humorist. The truth seems to be that Dickens imagined more evil people than did Thackeray, but that he had an eager faith in the good ones. Nothing places him so entirely out of date as his trust in human sanctity, his love of it, his hope for it. His leap at it. He saw it in a woman's face first met and drew it to himself in a man's hand first grasped. He looked keenly for it. 
And if he associated minor degrees of goodness with any kind of folly or mental ineptitude, he did not so relate sanctity, though he gave it for companion ignorance, and joined the two in Joe Gargery most tenderly. We might paraphrase, in regard to these two great authors, Dr. Johnson's famous sentence, Marriage has many pains, but celibacy has no joys. Dickens has many scoundrels, but Thackeray has no saints. Helen Pendennis is not holy, for she is unjust and cruel. Amelia is not holy, for she is an egoist in love. Lady Castlewood is not holy, for she too is cruel. And even Lady Jane is not holy, for she is jealous. Nor is Colonel Newcombe holy, for he is haughty. Nor Dobbin, for he turns with a taunt upon a plain sister. Nor Esmond, for he squanders his best years in love for a material beauty. And these are the best of his good people. And readers have been taught to praise the work of him who makes none perfect. One does not meet perfect people in trains or at dinner. And this seemed good cause that the novelist should be praised for his moderation. It seemed to imitate the usual measure and moderation of nature. But Charles Dickens closed with a divine purpose divinely different. He consented to the counsels of perfection, and thus he made Joe Gargery, not a man one might easily find in a forge, and Esther Summerson, not a girl one may easily meet at a dance, and Little Dorrit, who does not come to do a day's sewing. Not that the man and the woman are inconceivable, but that they are unfortunately improbable. They are creatures created through a creating mind that worked its six days for the love of good, and never rested until the seventh, the final Sabbath. But granting that they are the counterpart, the heavenly side of caricature, this is not to condemn them. Since when has caricature ceased to be an art good for man, an honest game between him and nature? It is a tenable opinion that frank caricature is a better incident of art than the mere exaggeration which is the more modern practice. The words mean the same thing in their origin, an overloading. But as we now generally delimit the words, they differ. Caricature, when it has the grotesque inspiration, makes for laughter, and when it has the celestial, makes for admiration. In either case, there is a good understanding between the author and the reader, or between the draftsman and the spectator. We need not, for example, suppose that Ibsen sat in a room surrounded by a repeating pattern of his hair and whiskers on the wallpaper but it makes us most exceedingly mirthful and joyous to see him thus seated in Mr. Max Beerbohm's drawing. And perhaps no girl ever went through life without harboring a thought of self, but it is very good for us all to know that such a girl was thought of by Dickens, that he loved his thought, and that she is ultimately to be traced through Dickens to God. But exaggeration establishes no good understanding between the reader and the author. It is a solemn appeal to our credulity and we are right to resent it. It is the violence of a weakling hand, the worst manner of violence. Exaggeration is conspicuous in the newer poetry, and is so far, therefore, successful, conspicuousness being its aim. But it was also the vice of Swinburne, and was the bad example he set to the generation that thought his tunings to be the finest music. For instance, in an early poem, he intends to tell us how a man who loved a woman welcomed the sentence that condemned him to drown with her, bound, his impassioned breast against hers, abhorring. He might have convinced us of that welcome by one phrase of the profound exactitude of genius. But he makes his man cry out for the greatest bliss and the greatest imaginable glory to be bestowed upon the judge who pronounces the sentence. And this is merely exaggeration. One takes pleasure in rebuking the false ecstasy by a word thus prim and prosaic. The poet intended to impose upon us, and he fails. We withdraw our attention, as Dr. Johnson did when the conversation became foolish. In truth, we do more, for we resent exaggeration if we care for our English language. For exaggeration writes relaxed and not elastic words and verses, and it is possible that the language suffers something, at least temporarily during the life of a couple of generations, let us say, from the loss of elasticity and rebound brought about by such strain. Moreover, exaggeration has always to outdo itself progressively. There should have been a dirtles to tell this Swinburne that the habit of exaggerating, like that of boasting, grows upon you. It may be added that later poetry shows us an instance of exaggeration in the work of that major poet, Mr. Lascelles Abercrombie. His violence and vehemence, his extremity, are generally signs not of weakness but of power, 
and yet once he reaches a breaking point that power should never know. This is where his Judith holds herself to be so smirched and degraded by the proffer of a reverent love, she being devoted to one only, a dead man who had her heart, that thenceforth no bar is left to her entire self-sacrifice to the loathed enemy Holofernes. To this, too, the prim rebuke is the just one, a word for the mouth of governesses. My dear, you exaggerate. It may be briefly said that exaggeration takes for granted some degree of imbecility in the reader, whereas caricature takes for granted a high degree of intelligence. Dickens appeals to our intelligence in all his caricature, whether heavenly, as in Joe Gargery, or impish, as in Mrs. Micawber. The word caricature that is used a thousand times to reproach him is the word that does him singular honor. If I may define my own devotion to Dickens, it may be stated as chiefly, though not wholly, admiration of his humor, his dramatic tragedy, and his watchfulness over inanimate things and landscape. Passages of his books that are ranged otherwise than under those characters often leave me out of the range of their appeal, or else definitely offend me. And this is not for the customary reason, that Dickens could not draw a gentleman, that Dickens could not draw a lady. It matters little whether he could or not. But as a fact, he did draw a gentleman, and drew him excellently well, in Cousin Phoenix, as Mr. Chesterton has decided. The question of the lady we may waive. If it is difficult to prove a negative, it is difficult also to present one, and to the making or producing, or liberating, or detaching, or exalting of the character of a lady, there enter many negatives, and Dickens was an obvious and a positive man. Esther Summerson is a lady, but she is so much besides that her ladyhood does not detach itself from her sainthood and her angelhood, so as to be conspicuous, if, indeed, conspicuousness may be properly predicated of the quality of a lady. It is a conventional saying that sainthood and angelhood include the quality of a lady, but that saying is not true. A lady has a great number of negatives all her own, and also some things positive that are not at all included in goodness. However this may be, and it is not important, Dickens, the genial Dickens, makes savage sport of women. Such a company of envious dames and damsels cannot be found among the persons of the satirist Thackeray. Kate Nickleby's beauty brings upon her at first sight the enmity of her workshop companions. In the innocent pages of Pickwick, the aunt is jealous of the niece, and the niece retorts by wounding the vanity of the aunt as keenly as she may and so forth, through early books and late. He takes for granted that the women, old and young, who are not his heroines, wage this war within the sex, being disappointed by defect of nature and fortune. Dickens is master of wit, humor, and derision, and it must be confessed that his derision is abundant and is cast upon an artificially exposed and helpless people. That is, he, a man, derides the women who miss what a man declared to be their whole existence. The advice which Monsieur Rodin received in his youth from Constant, learn to see the other side, never look at forms only in extent, learn to see them always in relief, is the contrary of the counsel proper for a reader of Dickens. That counsel should be, do not insist upon seeing the immortal figures of comedy in the round. You are to be satisfied with their face value, the face of two dimensions. It is not necessary that you should seize Mr. Pecksniff from beyond and grasp the whole man and his destinies. The hypocrite is a figure dreadful and tragic, a shape of horror. And Mr. Pecksniff is a hypocrite and a bright image of heart-easing comedy. For comic fiction cannot exist without some such paradox. Without it, where would our laugh be in response to the generous genius which gives us Mr. Pecksniff's parenthesis to the mention of sirens? Pagan, I regret to say and the scene in which Mr. Pecksniff, after a stormy domestic scene within, goes, as it were, accidentally to the door to admit the rich kinsman he wishes to propitiate. Then Mr. Pecksniff, gently warbling a rustic stave, put on his garden hat, seized a spade, and opened the street door, as if he thought he had, from his vineyard, heard a modest rap, but was not quite certain. The visitor had thundered at the door while outcries of family strife had been rising in the home. It is an ancient pursuit, gardening. Primitive, my dear sir, for if I am not mistaken, Adam was the first of the calling. My Eve, I grieve to say, is no more, sir, but... And here he pointed to his spade and shook his head, as if he were not cheerful without an effort. But I do a little bit of Adam still. 
he had by this time got them into the best parlour where the portrait by spiller and the bust by spoker were and again mr pecksniff hospitable at the supper table this he said in allusion to the party not the wine is a mingling that repays one for much disappointment and vexation let us be merry here he took a captain's biscuit it is a poor heart that never rejoices and our hearts are not poor no with such stimulants to merriment did he beguile the time and do the honours of the table moreover it is a mournful thing and an inexplicable that a man should be as mad as mr dick none the less it is a happy thing for any reader to watch mr dick while david explains his difficulty to traddles mr dick was to be employed in copying but king charles i could not be kept out of the manuscripts mr dick in the meantime looked very deferentially and seriously at traddles and sucking his thumb and the amours of the gentlemen in gaiters who threw the vegetable marrows over the garden wall mr f s aunt again an augustus model our own model whom a great french critic most justly and accurately brooded over augustus the gloomy maniac says taine makes us shudder a good medical diagnosis long live the logical french intellect truly humor talks in his own language nay his own dialect whereas passion and pity speak the universal tongue it is strange it seems to me deplorable that dickens himself was not content to leave his wonderful hypocrite one who should stand imperishable in comedy in the two dimensions of his own admirable art after he had enjoyed his own pecksniff tasting him with the strenuous tongue of keats voluptuary bursting joy's grapes against his palate fine dickens most unfairly gives himself the other and incompatible joy of grasping his pecksniff in the third dimension seizes him in the round horsewhips him out of all keeping and finally kicks him out of a splendid art of fiction into a sorry art of poetical justice a pecksniff not only defeated but undone and yet dickens retribution upon sinners is a less fault than his reforming them it is truly an act denoting excessive simplicity of mind in him he never veritably allows his responsibility as a man to lapse men ought to be good or else to become good and he does violence to his own excellent art and yields it up to his sense of morality ah can we measure by years the time between that day and this is the fastidious the impartial the non-moral novelist only the grandchild and not the remote posterity of dickens who would not leave scrooge to his egoism or gradgrind to his facts or mercy pecksniff to her absurdity or dombey to his pride nay who makes micawber finally to prosper truly the most unpardonable thing dickens did in those deplorable last chapters of his was the prosperity of mr micawber of a son in difficulties the perfect micawber nature is respected as to his origin and then perverted as to his end it is a pity that mr peggotty ever came back to england with such tidings and our last glimpse of the emigrants had been made joyous by the sight of the young micawbers on the eve of emigration every child had its own wooden spoon attached to its body by a strong line in preparation for colonial life and then dickens must needs go behind the gay scenes and tell us that the long and untiring delight of the book was over mr micawber in the colonies was never again to make punch with lemons in a crisis of his fortunes and resume his peeling with a desperate air nor to observe the expression of his friends faces during mrs micawber's masterly exposition of the financial situation or of the possibilities of the coal trade nor to eat walnuts out of a paper bag what time the die was cast and all was over alas nothing was over until mr micawber's pecuniary liabilities were over and the perfect comedy turned into dullness the joyous impossibility of a figure of immortal fun into cold improbability there are several such late or last chapters that one would gladly cut away that of mercy pecksniff's pathos for example that of mr dombey's installation in his daughter's home that which undeceives us as to mr boffin's antic disposition but how true and how whole a heart it was that urged these unlucky conclusions how shall we venture to complain the hand that made its pecksniff in pure wit has it not the right to belabor him in earnest albeit a kind of earnest that disappoints us and mr dombey is dickens own dombey and he must do what he will with that finely wrought figure of pride but there is a little irony in the fact that dickens leaves more than one villain to his orderly fate for whom we care little either way it is nothing to us whom carker never convinced 
that the train should catch him, nor that the man with the moustache and the nose, who did but weary us, should be crushed by the falling house. Here the end holds good in art, but the art was not good from the first. But then again, neither does Bill Sykes experience a change of heart, nor Jonas Chuzzlewit, and the end of each is most excellently told. George Meredith said that the most difficult thing to write in fiction was dialogue, but there is surely one thing at least as difficult, a thing so rarely well done that a mere reader might think it to be more difficult than dialogue, and that is the telling what happened. Something of the fatal languor and preoccupation that persists beneath all the violence of our stage, our national undramatic character, is perceptible in the narrative of our literature. The things the usual modern author says are proportionately more energetically produced than those he tells. But Dickens, being simple and dramatic, and capable of one thing at a time, and that thing whole, tells us what happened with a perfect speed which has neither hurry nor delays. Those who saw him act found him a fine actor, and this we might know by reading the murder in Oliver Twist, the murder in Martin Chuzzlewit, the coming of the train upon Carker, the long moment of recognition when Pip sees his guest, the convict, reveal himself in his chambers at night. The swift spirit, the hammering blow of his narrative, drive the great storm in David Copperfield through the poorest part of the book, Steerforth's story. There is surely no greater gale to be read of than this, from the very first words. Don't you think that, I said to the coachman, a very remarkable sky? To the end of a magnificent chapter, flying clouds tossed up into the most remarkable heaps, suggesting greater heights in the clouds than there were depths below them. There had been a wind all day, and it was rising then with an extraordinary great sound. Long before we saw the sea, its spray was on our lips. The water was out over the flat country, and every sheet and puddle lashed its banks and had its stress of little breakers. When we came within sight of the sea, the waves on the horizon, caught at intervals above the boiling abyss, were like glimpses of another shore, with towers and buildings. The people came to their doors all aslant and with streaming hair. David dreams of a cannonade when at last he fell off a tower and down a precipice into the depths of sleep. In the morning, the wind might have lulled a little, though not more sensibly than if the cannonading I had dreamed of had been diminished by the silencing of half a dozen guns out of hundreds. It went from me with a shock, like a ball from a rifle, says David in another place, after the visit of a delirious impulse. Here is the volley of departure, the shock of passion vanishing more perceptibly than it came. The tragedy in David Copperfield combines Dickens' dramatic tragedy of narrative with his wonderful sense of sea and land. But here are landscapes in quietness. There has been rain this afternoon, and a wintry shudder goes among the little pools in the cracked, uneven flagstones. Some of the leaves, in a timid rush, seek sanctuary within the low-arched cathedral door, but two men coming out resist them and cast them out with their feet. The autumn leaves fall thick, but never fast, for they come circling down with a dead lightness. Again, now the woods settle into great masses as if they were one profound tree. And yet again, I held my mother in my embrace, and she held me in hers. And among the still woods in the silence of the summer day, there seemed to be nothing but our two troubled minds that was not at peace. Yet, with a thousand great felicities of diction, Dickens had no body of style. Dickens, having the single and simple heart of a moralist, had also the simple eyes of a free intelligence and the light heart. He gave his senses their way, and well did they serve him. Thus his eyes, and no more modern man in anxious search of impressions, was ever so simple and so masterly. Mr. Voles gauntly stalked to the fire and warmed his funereal gloves. I thank you, said Mr. Voles, putting out his long black sleeve to check the ringing of the bell. Not any. Mr. and Mrs. Tope are daintily sticking sprigs of holly into the carvings and sconces of the cathedral stalls, as if they were sticking them into the buttonholes of the dean and chapter. The two young Eurasians, brother and sister, had a certain air upon them of hunter and huntress, yet withal a certain air of being the objects of the chase rather than the followers. This phrase lacks elegance, and Dickens is not often inelegant, as those who do not read him may be surprised to learn, but the impression is admirable. So is that which follows, an indefinable kind of pause coming and going on their whole expression, both of face and form. 
Here is pure, mere impression again. Miss Murderstone, who was busy at her writing desk, gave me her cold fingernails. Lady Tippin's hand is rich in knuckles, and here is vision with great dignity. All beyond his figure was a vast dark curtain in solemn movement towards one quarter of the heavens. With that singleness of sight, and his whole body was full of the light of it, he had also the single hearing. The scene is in the Court of Chancery on a London November day. Leaving this address ringing in the rafters of the roof, the very little council drops, and the fog knows him no more. Mr. Voles emerged into the silence he could scarcely be said to have broken, so stifled was his tone. Within the grill gate of the chancel, up the steps surmounted loomingly by the fast darkening organ, white robes could be dimly seen, and one feeble voice, rising and falling in a cracked, monotonous mutter, could at intervals be faintly heard, until the organ and the choir burst forth and drowned it in a sea of music. Then the sea fell, and the dying voice made another feeble effort, and then the sea rose high and beat its life out, and lashed the roof, and surged among the arches, and pierced the heights of the great tower, and then the sea was dry, and all was still. And this is how a listener overheard men talking in the cathedral hollows. The word confidence, shattered by the echoes, but still capable of being pieced together, is uttered. Wit, humor, derision. To each of these words we assign by custom a part in the comedy of literature, and again, those who do not read Dickens, perhaps even those who read him a little, may acclaim him as a humorist and not know him as a wit. But that writer is a wit, whatever his humor, who tells us of a member of the tight barnacle family who had held a sinecure office against all protest, that he died with his drawn salary in his hand. But let it be granted that Dickens the humorist is foremost and most precious, for we might well spare the phrase of wit just quoted rather than the one describing Traddles, whose hair stood up as one who looked as though he had seen a cheerful ghost, or rather than this, he was so wooden a man that he seemed to have taken his wooden leg naturally, and rather suggested to the fanciful observer that he might be expected, if his development received no untimely check, to be completely set up with a pair of wooden legs in about six months, or rather than the incident of the butcher and the beefsteak. He gently presses it in a cabbage leaf into Tom Pinch's pocket. For meat, he said with some emotion, must be humoured, not drove. A generation between his own and the present thought Dickens to be vulgar. If the cause of that judgment was that he wrote about people in shops, the cause is discredited now that shops are the scenes of the novelist's research. High life and most wretched life have now given place to the little shop and its parlor during a year or two. But Dr. Brown, the author of Rab and His Friends, thought that Dickens committed vulgarities in his diction. A good man was Robin, is right enough, but he was a good man was Robin, is not so well, and we must own that it is Dickensian. But assuredly, Dickens writes such phrases as it were dramatically, playing the cockney. I know of but two words that Dickens habitually misuses, and Charles Lamb misuses one of them precisely in Dickens' manner. It is not worthwhile to quote them. But for these, his English is admirable. He chooses what is good and knows what is not. A little representative collection of the bad or foolish English of his day might be made by gathering up what Dickens forbore and what he derided. For instance, Mr. Micawber's portly phrase, gratifying emotions of no common description, and Littimer's report that the young woman was partial to the sea. This was the polite language of that time, as we conclude when we find it to be the language that Charlotte Bronte shook off, but before she shook it off, she used it. Dickens, too, had something to throw off. In his earlier books, there is an inflation. Rounded words fill the inappropriate mouth of Bill Sykes himself, but he discarded them with a splendid laugh. They are charged upon Mr. Micawber in his own character as author. See him as he sits by to hear Captain Hopkins read the petition in the debtor's prison from His Most Gracious Majesty's Unfortunate Subjects. Mr. Micawber listened, we read, with a little of an author's vanity, contemplating, not severely, the spikes upon the opposite wall. It should be remembered that when Dickens shook himself free of everything that hampered his genius, he was not so much beloved or so much applauded as when he gave to his cordial readers matter for facile sentiment and for humor of the second order. His public were eager to be moved and to laugh, and he gave them Little Nell and Sam Weller. 
he loved to please them, and it is evident that he pleased himself also. Mr. Micawber, Mr. Pecksniff, Mrs. Nickleby, Mrs. Chick, Mrs. Pipchin, Mr. Augustus Model, Mrs. Jellyby, Mrs. Plornish, are not so famous as Sam Weller and Little Nell, nor as Traddles, whose hair looked as though he had seen a cheerful ghost. We are told of the delight of the Japanese man in a chance finding of something strange-shaped, in a symmetry that has an accidental felicity, an interest. If he finds such a grace or disproportion, whatever the interest may be, in a stone or a twig that has caught his ambiguous eye at the roadside, he carries it to his home to place it in its irregularly happy place. Dickens seems to have had a like joy in things misshapen or strangely shapen, uncommon or grotesque. He saddled even his heroes. Those heroes are, perhaps, his worst work, young men at once conventional and improbable, with whimsically ugly names, while his invented names are whimsically perfect. That of Voles, for the predatory silent man in black. That of Tope, for the cathedral verger. A suggestion of dark and vague flight in Voles something of old floors, something respectably furtive and musty in taupe. In Dickens, the love of lurking unusual things, human and inanimate, he wrote of his discoveries delightedly in his letters, was hypertrophied, and it has its part in the simplest and the most fantastic of his humors, especially those that are due to his childlike eyesight. Let us read, for example, of the rooks that seem to attend upon Dr. Strong, late of Canterbury, in his Highgate Garden, as if they had been written to about him by the Canterbury rooks and were observing him closely in consequence, and of Master Micawber, who had a remarkable head voice. On looking at Master Micawber again, I saw that he had a certain expression of face, as if his voice were behind his eyebrows, and of Joe in his Sunday clothes, a scarecrow in good circumstances, and of the cook's cousin in the lifeguards, with such long legs that he looked like the afternoon shadow of somebody else and of Mrs. Markleham, who stared more like a figurehead intended for a ship to be called the Astonishment than anything else I can think of. But there is no reader who has not a thousand such exhilarating little sights in his memory of these pages. From the gently grotesque to the fantastic run Dickens' enchanted eyes, and in Quilp and Mrs. Moucher he takes his joy in the extreme of deformity, and a spontaneous combustion was an accident much to his mind. Dickens wrote for a world that either was exceedingly excitable and sentimental, or had the convention or tradition of great sentimental excitability. All his people, suddenly surprised, lose their presence of mind. Even when the surprise is not extraordinary, their actions are wild. When Tom Pinch calls upon John Westlock in London, after no very long separation, John, welcoming him at breakfast, puts the rolls into his boots and so forth. And this kind of distraction comes upon men and women everywhere in his books, distractions of laughter as well. All this seems artificial today, whereas Dickens in his best moments was the simplest, as he is the most vigilant of men. But his public was as present to him as an actor's audience is to the actor, and I cannot think that this immediate response was good for his art. Assuredly, he is not solitary. We should not wish him to be solitary as a poet is, but we may wish that now and again, even while standing applauded and acclaimed, he had appraised the applause more coolly and more justly, and within his inner mind. Those critics who find what they call vulgarisms think they may safely go on to accuse Dickens of bad grammar. The truth is that his grammar is not only good but strong. It is far better in construction than Thackeray's, the ease of whose phrase sometimes exceeds and is slack. Lately, during the recent centenary time, a writer averred that Dickens might not always be parsed, but that we loved him for his etc., etc. Dickens' page is to be parsed as strictly as any man's. It is, apart from the matter of grammar, a wonderful thing that he, with his little education, should have so excellent a diction. In a letter that records his reluctance to work during a holiday, the word wave seems to me perfect. Imaginary butchers and bakers wave me to my desk. In his exquisite use of the word establishment in the following phrase, we find his own perfect sense of the use of words in his own day. But in the second quotation given, there is a most beautiful sign of education. Under the weight of my wicked secret, the little boy Pip had succored his convict with his brother-in-law's provisions, I pondered whether the church would be powerful enough to shield me if I divulged to that establishment. 
And this is the phrase that may remind us of the 18th century writers of prose, and among those writers of none so readily is of Bolingbroke. It occurs in that passage of Esther's life in which, having lost her beauty, she resolves to forego a love unavowed. There was nothing to be undone, no chain for him to drag or for me to break. If Dickens had had the education which he had not, his English could not have been better. But if he had had the usage du monde, which as a young man he had not, there would have been a difference. He would not, for instance, have given us the preposterous scenes in Nicholas Nickleby, in which parts are played by Lord Frederick Verisoft, Sir Mulberry Hawk, and their friends. The scene of the hero's luncheon at a restaurant and the dreadful description of the mirrors and other splendors would not have been written. It is a very little thing to forgive to him whom we have to thank for, well, not perhaps for the houseful of friends, for the gift of whom a stranger, often quoted, once blessed him in the street. We may not wish for Mr. Feeder or Major Bagstock, or Mrs. Chick or Mrs. Pipchin, or Mr. Augustus Model, or Mr. F.'s aunt, or Mr. Wopsle, or Mr. Pumblechook, as an inmate of our homes. Lack of knowledge of the polite world is, I say, a very little thing to forgive to him whom we thank most chiefly for showing us these interesting people just named as inmates of the comedy homes that are not ours. We thank him because they are comedy homes, and could not be ours or any man's. That is, we thank him for his admirable art. End of chapter 2 Recording by Colleen McMahon Chapter 3 of Hearts of Controversy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Kempton. Hearts of Controversy by Alice Maynell. Chapter 3 Swinburne's Lyrical Poetry. The makers of epigrams, of phrases, of pages, of all more or less brief judgments, assuredly waste their time when they sum up any one of all mankind, and how do they squander it when their matter is a poet? They may hardly describe him, nor shall any student's care, or psychologist's formula, or man of letters summary, or wit's sentence define him. Definitions, because they must not be inexact or incomprehensive, sweep too wide, and the poet is not held within them and out of the mere describer's range and capture he may escape by as many doors as there are outlets from a forest. But much ready-made platitude brings about the world's guesses at a poet, and false and flat thought lies behind its epigrams. It is not long since the general guesswork assigned melancholy, without authority, to a poet lately deceased. Real poets, it was said, are unhappy, and this one was exceptionally real. How unhappy must he then certainly have been? and the blessed Blake himself was incidentally cited as one of the company of depression and despair. It is perhaps a liking for symmetry that prompts these futile syllogisms. Perhaps also it is the fear of human mystery. The biographer used to see the finger of God pat in the history of a man. He insists now that he shall at any rate see the finger of a law, or rather of a rule, a custom, a generality. Law I will not call it, there is no intelligible law that, for example, a true poet should be an unhappy man, but the observer thinks he has noticed a custom or habit to that effect, and Blake, who lived and died in bliss, is named at ignorant random, rather than that an example of the custom should be lost. But it is not only such a platitude of observation, such a cheap generality, that is silenced in the presence of the poet whose name is at the head of these pages. For if ever nature showed us a poet in whom our phrases and the judgments they record should be denied, defeated and confused, Swinburne is he. We predicate of a poet a great sincerity, a great imagination, a great passion, a great intellect. These are the master qualities. And yet we are compelled to see here, if we would not willfully be blind or blindfold, a poet, yes, a true poet, with a perfervid fancy rather than an imagination, a poet with puny passions, a poet with no more than the momentary and impulsive sincerity of an infirm soul, a poet with small intellect, and thrice a poet. And assuredly, if the creative arts are duly humbled in the universal contemplation of nature, if they are accused, if they are weighed, if they are found wanting, 
if they are excused by nothing but our intimate human sympathy with dear and interesting imperfection, if poetry stands outdone by the passion and experience of an inarticulate soul, and painting by the splendour of the day, and building by the forest and the cloud, there is another art also that has to be humiliated, and this is the art and science of criticism, confounded by its contemplation of such a poet. Poor little art of examination and formula! The miracle of day and night and immortality are needed to rebuke the nobler arts, but our art, the critics, mine today, is brought to book, and its heart is broken, and its sincerity disgraced, by the paradoxes of the truth. Not in the heavens, nor in the sub-celestial landscape, does this minor art find its refutation, but in the puzzle between a man and his gift, and in part the man is ignoble, and leads us by distasteful paths, and compels us to a reluctant work of literary detection. Useful is the critical spirit, but it loses heart when, to take a very definite instance, it has to ask what literary sincerity, what value for art and letters, lived in Swinburne, who hailed a certain old friend in a dedication as poet and painter, when he was pleased with him, and declared him poetaster and dauber, when something in that dead man's posthumous autobiography offended his own self-love. When I say criticism finds itself called upon, amid its admiration, to do such scavenger work, it loses heart as well as the clue, and would gladly go out into the free air of greater arts, and with them take exterior nature's nobler reprobation. I have to cite this instance of a change of mind, or of terms and titles, in Swinburne's estimate of art and letters, because it is all important to my argument. It is a change he makes in published print, and therefore no private matter, and I cite it not as a sign of moral fault, with which I have no business, but as a sign of a most significant literary insensibility. Insensibility, whether to the quality of a poetaster when he wrote poet, or to that of a poet when he wrote poetaster, is of no matter. Rather than justify the things I have ventured to affirm as to Swinburne's little intellect, and paltry degree of sincerity, and rachitic passion, and tumid fancy, judgment confounding things to predicate of a poet, I turn to the happier task of praise. A vivid writer of English was he, and would have been one of the recurring renewers of our oft-renewed and incomparable language, had his words not become habitual to himself, so that they quickly lost the light, the breeze, the breath, one whose fondness for beauty deserved the serious name of love, one whom beauty at times favoured and filled so visibly, by such obvious visits and possessions, favours so manifest, that inevitably we forget we are speaking fictions and allegories, and imagine her visiting power exterior to her poet, a man, moreover, of a less, not more, than manly receptiveness and appreciation, so that he was entirely and easily possessed by admirations. Less than manly we must call his extraordinary recklessness of appreciation. It is, as it were, ideally feminine. It is possible, however, that no woman has yet been capable of so entire an emotional impulse and impetus. More than manly it might have been, but for the lack of a responsible intellect in that impulse. Had it possessed such an intellectual sanction, Swinburne's admiration of Victor Hugo, Mazzini, Dickens, Baudelaire, and Théophile Gautier might have added one to the great generosities of the world. We are inclined to complain of such an objection to Swinburne's poetry as was prevalent at his earlier appearance, and may be found in criticisms of the time, before the later fashion of praise set in. The obvious objection that it was as indigent in thought as affluent in words, for, though a truth, it is an inadequate truth. It might be affirmed of many a verse writer, of not unusual talent and insignificance, whose affluence of words was inselective and merely abundant, and whose poverty of thought was something less than a national disaster. Swinburne's failure of intellect was, in the fullest and most serious sense, a national disaster, and his instinct for words was a national surprise. It is in their beauty that Swinburne's art finds its absolution from the obligations of meaning, according to the vulgar judgment, and we can hardly wonder. 
I wish it were not customary to write of one art in the terms of another, and I use the words music and musical under protest, because the world has been so delighted to call any verse pleasant to the ear musical, that it has not supplied us with another and more specialised and appropriate word. Swinburne is a complete master of the rhythm and rhyme, the time and accent, the pause, the balance, the flow of vowel and clash of consonants, that make the music for which verse is popular and prized. We need not complain that it is for the tune rather than for the melody, if we must use those alien terms, that he is chiefly admired, and even for the jingle rather than for the tune. He gave his readers all three, and all three in perfection. Nineteen out of twenty who take pleasure in this art of his will quote you first, When the hounds of spring are on winter's traces, the mother of months in meadow and plain, and the rest of the buoyant familiar lines. I confess there is something too obvious, insistent, emphatic, too dapper, to give me more than a slight pleasure. But it is possible that I am prejudiced by a dislike of English anapests. I am aware that the classic terms are not really applicable to our English metres, but the reader will understand that I mean the metre of the lines just quoted. I do not find these anapests in the Elizabethan or in the 17th century poets, or most rarely. They were dear to the 18th century, and, much more than the heroic couplet, are the distinctive metre of that age. They swagger, or worse, they strut, in its lighter verse, from its first year to its last. Swinburne's anapests are far too delicate for swagger or strut, but for all their dance, all their spring, all their flight, all their flutter, we are compelled to perceive that, as it were, they perform. I love to see English poetry move to many measures, to many numbers, but chiefly with the simple iambic and the simple trochaic foot. Those two are enough for the infinite variety, the epic, the drama, the lyric of our poetry. It is, accordingly, in these old traditional and proved metres that Swinburne's music seems to me most worthy, most controlled and most lovely. There is his best dignity, and therefore his best beauty. For even beauty is not to be thrust upon us. She is not to solicit us or offer herself to the first comer. And in the most admired of those flying lyrics, she is thus immoderately lavish of herself. He lays himself out, wrote Francis Thompson, in an anonymous criticism, to delight and seduce. The great poets entice by a glorious accident, but allurement in Mr. Swinburne's poetry is the Alpha and Omega. This is true of all that he has written. But it is true, in a more fatal sense, of these famous tunes of his music. Nay, delicate as they are, we are convinced that it is the less delicate ear that most surely takes much pleasure in them, the dull ear that chiefly they delight. Compare with such luxurious canterings the graver movement of this vision of spring and winter. Sunrise it sees not, neither set of star, large nightfall nor imperial plenilune, nor strong sweet shape of the full-breasted noon, but where the silver-sandaled shadows are, too soft for arrows of the sun to mar, moves with the mild gait of an ungrown moon. Even more valuable than this exquisite rhymed stanza is the blank verse which Swinburne released into new energies, new liberties and new movements. Milton, it need hardly be said, is the master of those who know how to place and displace the stress and accent of the English heroic line in epic poetry. His most majestic hand undid the mechanical bonds of the national line and made it obey the unwritten laws of his genius. His blank verse marches, pauses, lingers and charges. It feels the strain, it yields, it resists, it is all expressive. But if the practice of some of the poets succeeding him had tended to make it rigid and tame again, Swinburne was a new liberator. He writes when he ought with a finely appropriate regularity, as in the lovely line on the forest glades, that fear the fawns and know the dryad's foot, in which the rule is completely kept, every step of the five stepping from the unaccented place to the accented without a tremor. I must again protest that I use the word accent in a sense that has come to be adapted to English prosody, because it is so used by all writers on English metre, and is therefore understood by the reader, but I think stress the better word. 
but having written this perfect English iambic line so wonderfully fit for the sensitive quiet of the woods, he turns the page to the onslaught of such lines, heroic lines with a difference, as report the short-breathed messenger's reply to Althea's question, by whose hand the boar of Caledon had died. A maiden's and a prophet's and thy son's. It is lamentable that in his latest blank verse Swinburne should have made a trick and a manner of that most energetic device of his by which he leads the line at a rush from the first syllable to the tenth and on to the first of the line succeeding, with a great recoil to follow, as though a rider brought a horse to its haunches. It is in the same boar hunt, and fiery with invasive eyes and bristling with intolerable hair plunged. Sometimes we may be troubled, with a misgiving that Swinburne's fine narrative, as well as his descriptive writing of other kinds, has a counterpart in the programme music of some now bygone composers. It is even too descriptive, too imitative of things, and seems to outrun the province of words, somewhat as that did the province of notes. But though this hunting and checking and floating and flying in metre may be to strain the arts of prosody and diction, with how masterly a hand is the straining accomplished. The spear, the arrow, the attack, the charge, the footfall, the pinion, nay, the very stepping of the moon, the walk of the wind, are mimicked in this enchanting verse. Like to programme music, we must call it, but I wish the concert platform had ever justified this slight perversion of aim, this excess, almost corruption, of one kind of skill, thus miraculously well. Now, if Swinburne's exceptional faculty of diction led him to immoderate expressiveness, to immodest sweetness, to a jugglery and prestidigitation and conjuring of words, to transformations and transmutations of sound, if, I say, his extraordinary gift of diction brought him to this exaggeration of the manner, what a part does it not play in the matter of his poetry? So overweening a place does it take in this man's art, that I believe the words to hold and use his meaning, rather than the meaning to compass and grasp and use the word. I believe that Swinburne's thoughts have their source, their home, their origin, their authority and mission in those two places, his own vocabulary and the passion of other men. This is a grave charge. First, then, in regard to the passion of other men, I have given to his own emotion the puniest name I could find for it, I have no nobler name for his intellect. But other men had thoughts, other men had passions, political, sexual, natural, noble, vile, ideal, gross, rebellious, agonising, imperial, republican, cruel, compassionate, and with these he fed his verses. Upon these and their life he sustained, he fattened, he enriched his poetry. Mazzini in Italy, Gautier and Baudelaire in France, Shelley in England, made for him a base of passionate and intellectual supplies. With them he kept the all-necessary line of communication. We cease, as we see their active hearts possess his active art, to think a question as to his sincerity seriously worth asking. What sincerity he has is so absorbed in the one excited act of receptivity. That, indeed, he performs with all the will, all the precipitation, all the rush, all the surrender, all the whole-hearted weakness of his subservient and impetuous nature. I have not named the Greeks, nor the English Bible, nor Milton as his inspirers. These he would claim, they are not his. He received too partial, too fragmentary, too arbitrary an inheritance of the Greek spirit, too illusory an idea of Milton, of the English Bible little more than a tone. This poet, of eager, open capacity, this poet, who is little more, intellectually, than a too ready, too vacant capacity, for those three August seventies has not room enough. Charged, then, with other men's purposes, this man's Italian patriotism, this man's love of sin, by that name, for sin has been denied as a fiction, but Swinburne, following Baudelaire, acknowledges it to love it, this man's despite against the Third Empire, or what not, this man's cry for a political liberty granted or gained long ago, a cry grown vain, this man's contempt for the Boers, nay, was it so much as a man with a man's evil to answer for that furnished him here, was it not rather that less guilty judge, the crowd, this man's, nay, this boy's erotic sickness, or his cruelty, 
Charged with all these, Swinburne's poetry is primed. It explodes with thunder and fire. But such sharing is somewhat too familiar for dignity. Such community of goods parodies the Franciscans. As one friar goes darned for another's rending, having no property in cassock or cowl, so does many a poet, not in humility, but in a paradox of pride, boast of the past of others. And yet one might rather choose to make use of one's fellow men's old shoes than to put their old secrets to usufruct, and dress poetry in a motley of shed passions twice corrupt. Promiscuity of love we have heard of. Pope was accused, by Lord Harvey's indignation and wit, of promiscuity of hatred, and of scattering his disfavours in the stews of an indiscriminate malignity. And here is another promiscuity, that of memories, and of a licence partaken. But, by the unanimous poet's splendid love of the landscape and the skies, by this also was Swinburne possessed, and in this he triumphed. By this, indeed, he profited. Here he joined an innumerable company of that heavenly host of earth. Let us acknowledge, then, his honourable alacrity here, his quick fellowship, his agile adoption, and his filial tenderness, nay, his fraternal union with his poets. No tourists' admiration for all things French, no tourists' politics in Italy, and Swinburne's French and Italian admirations have the tourist manner of enthusiasm, prompts him here. Here he aspires to brotherhood with the supreme poets of supreme England, with the sixteenth century, the seventeenth, and the nineteenth, the impassioned centuries of song. Happy is he to be admitted among these, happy is he to merit by his wonderful voice to sing their raptures. Here is no humiliation in ready-made lendings, their ecstasy becomes him. He is glorious with them, and we can imagine this benign and indulgent nature confounding together the sons she embraces, and making her poets, the primary and the secondary, the greater and the lesser, all equals in her arms. Let us see him in that company where he looks noble amongst the noble. Let us not look upon him in the company of the ignoble, where he looks ignobler still, being servile to them. Let us look upon him with the lyrical Shakespeare, with Vaughan, Blake, Wordsworth, Patmore, Meredith, not with Baudelaire and Gautier, with the poets of the forest and the sun, and not with those of the alcove. We can make peace with him for love of them. We can imagine them thankful to him who, poor and perverse in thought in so many pages, could yet join them in such a song as this. And her heart sprang in Iselt, and she drew with all her spirit and life the sunrise through, and through her lips the keen triumphant air sea-scented, sweeter than land roses were, and through her eyes the whole rejoicing east sun-satisfied, and all the heaven at feast spread for the morning, and the imperious mirth of wind and light that moved upon the earth making the spring, and all the fruitful might and strong regeneration of delight that swells the seedling leaf and sapling man. He, nevertheless, who was able in high company to hail the sea with such fine verse, was not ashamed in low company to sing the famous absurdities about the lilies and languors of virtue and the roses and raptures of vice with many and many a passage of like character. I think it more generous, seeing I have differed so much from the nineteenth century's chorus of excessive praise, to quote little from the vacant, the paltry, the silly, no word is so fit as that last little word, among his pages. Therefore I have justified my praise, but not my blame. It is for the reader to turn to the justifying pages, to A Song of Italy, Les Noyades, Hermaphroditus, Satia te sanguine, kissing her hair, an interlude, in a garden, or such a stanza as the one beginning, O thought illimitable and infinite heart, whose blood is life in limbs indissolute, that all keep heartless thine invisible part, and inextirpable thy viewless root, whence all sweet shafts of green and each thy dart of sharpening leaf and bud resundering shoot. It is for the reader who has preserved rectitude of intellect, sincerity of heart, dignity of nerves, unhurried thoughts, an unexcited heart, and an ardour for poetry, to judge between such poems and an authentic passion, between such poems and truth. 
I will add between such poems and beauty. Imagery is a great part of poetry, but out, alas, vocabulary has here too the upper hand, for in what is still sometimes called the magnificent chorus in Atalanta, the words have swallowed not the thought only but the imagery. The poet's grievance is that the pleasant streams flow into the sea. What would he have? The streams turned loose all over the unfortunate country? There is, it is true, the river mole in Surrey, but I am not sure that some foolish imagery against the peace of the burrowing river might not be due from a poet of facility. I am not censuring any insincerity of thought. I am complaining of the insincerity of a paltry, shaky and unvisionary image. Having had recourse to the passion of stronger minds for his provision of emotions, Swinburne had direct recourse to his own vocabulary as a kind of safe, wherein he stored what he needed for a song. Claudius stole the precious diadem of the kingdom from a shelf and put it in his pocket. Swinburne took from the shelf of literature, took with what art, what touch, what cunning, what complete skill, the treasure of the language, and put it in his pocket. He is urgent with his booty of words, for he has no other treasure. Into his pocket he thrusts a hand groping for hatred, and draws forth blood, or hell, generally hell for I have counted many hells in a quite short poem. In search of wrath he takes hold of fire. Anxious for wildness he takes foam, for sweetness he brings out flower. Much linked, so that flower soft has almost become his and not Shakespeare's. For in that compound he labours to exaggerate Shakespeare, and by his insistence and iteration goes about to spoil for us the flower soft hands of Cleopatra's rudder maiden. For he shall not spoil Shakespeare's phrase for us. And behold, in all this fundamental fumbling, Swinburne's critics saw only a mannerism, if they saw even thus much offence. One of the chief pocket words was liberty. O oh, liberty, what verse is committed in thy name? Or, to cite Madame Roland more accurately, O oh, liberty, how have they run thee? Who, it has been well asked by a citizen of a modern free country, is thoroughly free, except a fish? Et encore? Even the silent and footless herds may have more interaccommodation than we are aware. But in the pocket of the secondary poet, how easy and how ready a word is this, a word implying old and true heroisms, but significant here of an excitable poet's economies, yes, economies, of thought and passion. This poet, who is conspicuously the poet of excess, is in deeper truth the poet of penury and defect. And here is a pocket word which might have astonished us, had we not known how little anyway it signified. It occurs in something customary about Italy. Hearest thou, Italia, though deaf sloth hath sealed thine ears? The world has heard thy children, and God hears. Was ever thought so pouched, so produced, so surely a handful of loot, as the last thought of this verse? What, finally, is his influence upon the language he has ransacked? A temporary laying waste, undoubtedly. That is, the contemporary use of his vocabulary is spoilt. His beautiful words are wasted, spent, squandered, gaspier. The contemporary use, I will not say the future use, for no critic should prophesy, but the past he has not been able to violate. He has had no power to rob of their freshness the sixteenth-century flower, the seventeenth-century fruit, or by his violence to shake from either a drop of their dues. At the outset I warned the judges and the pronouncers of sentences how this poet, with other poets of quite different character, would escape their summaries, and he has indeed refuted that maxim which I had learned at illustrious knees. You may not dissociate the matter and manner of any of the greatest poets, the two are so fused by integrity of fire whether in tragedy, or epic, or in the simplest song, that the sundering is the vainest task of criticism. But I cannot read Swinburne and not be compelled to divide his second-hand and enfeebled and excited matter from the successful art of his word. Of that word Francis Thompson has said again, it imposes a law on the sense. Therefore he too perceived that fatal division. Is then the wisdom of the maxim confounded? Or is Swinburne's a single and accepted case? 
accepted by a thousand degrees of talent from any generality fitting the obviously lesser poets, but possibly also accepted by an essential inferiority from this great maxim fitting only the greatest. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Hearts of Controversy」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « Hearts of Controversy » by Alice Raynell Chapter Four Charlotte and Emily Bronte The controversy here is with those who admire Charlotte Bronte throughout her career she altered greatly she did in fact inherit a manner of english that had been strained beyond restoration fatigued beyond recovery by the corrupt following of gibbon and there was within her a sense of propriety that caused her to conform straitened and serious elder daughter of her time she kept the house of literature she practised those verbs to events to reside to intimate, to peruse. She wrote communicating instruction for teaching, an extensive and eligible connection, a small competency, an establishment on the continent. It operated as a barrier to further intercourse, and of a child, with a singular unfitness with childhood, for the toys he possesses he seems to have contracted a partiality amounting to affection i have been already reproached for a word on gibbon written by way of parenthesis in the course of an appreciation of some other author let me therefore repeat that i am writing of the corrupt following of that apostle and not of his own style gibbon's grammar is frequently weak but the corrupt followers have something worse than poor grammar gibbon set the fashion of the latter and the former our literature was for at least half a century strewn with the wreckage of gibbon after suppressing a competitor who had assumed the purple at minst he refused to gratify his troops with the plunder of the rebellious city writes the great historian when mr micawber confesses gratifying emotions of no common description he conforms to a lofty and a distant gibbon so does mr pecksniff when he says of the copper founder's daughter that she has shed a vision on my path refulgent in its nature and when an author in a work on the divine comedy recently told us that paolo and francesca were to receive from dante such alleviation as circumstances would allow that also is a shattered a waste gibbon a waif of gibbon for johnson less than gibbon inflated the english our fathers inherited because johnson did not habitually or often use imagery whereas gibbon did use habitual imagery and such use is what deprives a language of elasticity and leaves it either rigid or languid oftener languid encumbered by this drift and refuse of english charlotte bronte yet achieved the miracle of her vocabulary it is less wonderful that she should have appeared out of such a parsonage than that she should have arisen out of such a language a re-reading of her works is always a new amazing of her reader who turns back to review the harvest of her english it must have been with rapture that she claimed her own simplicity and with what a moderation how temperately and how seldom she used her mastery to the last she has an occasional attachment to her bonds for she was not only fire and air in one passage of her life she may remind us of the little colourless and thrifty henbird that lowell watched nest building with her mate and cutting short the flutterings and billings wherewith he would joyously interrupt the business charlotte's nesting bird was a clergyman he came lately affianced for a week's visit to her parsonage and she wrote to her friend before his arrival my little plans have been disarranged by an intimation that mr is coming on monday and afterwards 
in reference to her sewing he hindered me for a full week in alternate pages villette is a book of spirit and fire and a novel of illiberal rancor of ungenerous uneducated anger ungentle ignoble in order to forgive its offences we have to remember in its author's favor not her pure style set free not her splendor in literature but rather the immeasurable sorrow of her life to read of that sorrow again is to open once more a wound which most men perhaps certainly most women received into their hearts in childhood for the life of charlotte bronte is one of the first books of biography put into the hands of a child to whom jane eyre is allowed only in passages we are young when we first hear in what narrow beds the three are laid the two sisters and the brother and in what a bed of living insufferable memories the one left lay alone reviewing the hours of their death alone in the sealed house that was only less narrow than their graves the rich may set apart and dedicate a room the poor change their street but charlotte bronte in the close captivity of the fortunes of mediocrity rested in the chair that had been her dying sister's and held her melancholy bridles in the dining-room that had been the scene of terrible and reluctant death but closer than the conscious house was the conscious mind locked with intricate wards within the unrelaxing and unlapsing thoughts of this lonely sister dwelt a sorrow inconsolable it is well for the perpetual fellowship of mankind that no child should read this life and not take therefrom a perdurable scar albeit her heart was somewhat frigid towards childhood and she died before her motherhood could be born mistress of some of the best prose of her century charlotte bronte was subject to a lose a chorley a miss martineau that is she suffered what in italian is called sagazzini in their presence when she had met six minor contemporary writers by-products of literature at dinner she had a headache and a sleepless night she writes to her friend that these contributors to the quarterly press are greatly feared in literary london and there is in her letter a sense of tremor and exhaustion and what nights did the heads of the critics undergo after the meeting those whose own romances are all condoned all forgiven by time and oblivion who gave her lessons who told her to study jane austen the others whose reviews doubtless did their proportionate part in still furthering hunting and harrying the tired english of their day and before harriet martineau she bore herself reverently harriet martineau albeit a woman of masculine understanding we may imagine we hear her contemporaries give her the title could not thread her way safely in and out of two or three negatives but wrote about this very charlotte bronte i did not consider the book a coarse one though i could not answer for it that there were no traits which on a second leisurely reading i might not dislike mrs gaskell quotes the passage with no consciousness of anything amiss as for lou's vanished lesson upon the methods of jane austen it served one only sufficient purpose itself is not quoted by any one alive but charlotte bronte's rejoinder adds one to our little treasury of her incomparable pages if they were twenty they are twenty-one by the addition of this written in a long neglected letter and save for us by mr shorter's research for i believe his is the only record what sees keenly speaks aptly moves flexibly it suits her to study but what throbs fast and full though hidden what blood rushes through what is the unseen seat of life and the sentiment target of death that miss austin ignores when the author of jane eyre faltered before six authors more or less at dinner in london was it the writer of her second-class english who was shy or was it the author of the passages here to follow and therefore one for whom the national tongue was much the better there can be little doubt 
the charlotte bronte who used the english of a world long corrupted by one good custom the good custom of gibbon's latinity grown fatally popular could at any time hold up her head amongst her reviewers for her there was no sensitive interior solitude in that society she who cowered was the charlotte who made rochester recall the simple yet sagacious grace of jane's first smile she who wrote i looked at my love it shivered in my heart like a suffering child in a cold cradle who wrote to see what a heavy lid day slowly lifted what a wan glance she flung upon the hills you would have thought the sun's fire quenched in last night's floods this new genius was solitary and afraid and touched to the quick by the eyes and voice of judges in her worst style there was no quick latin english whether scholarly or unscholarly is the mediate tongue and unscholarly latin english is proof against the world the scholarly latin english wherefrom it is disastrously derived is in its own nobler measure a defence against more august assaults than those of criticism in the strength of it did johnson hold parley with his profounder sorrows hold parley by his phrase make terms by his definition give them at last lodging and entertainment after sentence and treaty and the meaner office of protection against reviewers and the world was doubtless done by the meaner latinity the author of the phrase the child contracted a partiality for his toys had no need to fear any authors she might meet at dinner against charlotte bronte's sorrows her worst manner of english never stands for a moment those vain phrases fall from before her face and her barred heart to the heart to the heart she took the shafts of her griefs she tells them therefore as she suffered them vitally and mortally a great change approached affliction came in that shape which to anticipate is dread to look back on grief my sister emily first declined never in all her life had she lingered over any task that lay before her and she did not linger now she made haste to leave us i remembered where the three were laid in what narrow dark dwellings do you know this place no you never saw it but you recognize the nature of these trees this foliage the cypress the willow the yew stone crosses like these are not unfamiliar to you nor are these dim garlands of everlasting flowers here is the place then the watcher approaches the patient's pillow and sees a new and strange moulding of the familiar features feels at once that the insufferable moment draws nigh in the same passage comes another single word of genius the sound that so wastes our strength and fine as wastes is the wronged of another sentence some wronged and fettered wild beast or bird it is easy to gather such words more difficult to separate the best from such a mingled page as that on imagination a spirit softer and better than human reason had descended with quiet flight to the waste and my hunger has this good angel appeased with food sweet and strange and this daughter of heaven remembered me to-night she saw me weep and she came with comfort sleep she said sleep sweetly i gild thy dreams was this feeling dead i do not know but it was buried sometimes i thought the tomb unquiet perhaps the most eloquent pages are unluckily those wherein we miss the friction friction of water to the oar friction of air to the pinion friction that sensibly proves the use the buoyancy the act of language sometimes an easy eloquence resembles the easy labors of the daughters of danaeus to draw water in a sieve is an easy art rapid and relaxed but no laxity is ever i think to be found in her brief passages of landscape the keen still cold of the morning was succeeded 
later in the day by a sharp breathing from the russian wastes the cold zone sighed over the temperate zone and froze it fast not till the destroying angel of tempest had achieved his perfect work would he fold the wings whose laugh was thunder the tremor of those plumes was storm the night is not calm the equinox still struggles in its storms the wild rains of the day are abated the great single cloud disappears and rolls away from heaven not passing and leaving a sea all sapphire but tossed buoyant before a continued long-sounding high-rushing moonlight tempest no endymion will watch for his goddess to-night there are no flocks on the mountains see too this ocean the sway of the whole great deep above a herd of whales rushing through the livid and liquid thunder down from the frozen zone and this promise of the visionary surely i am to be walking by myself on deck rather late of an august evening watching and being watched by a full harvest moon something is to rise white on the surface of the sea over which that moon mounts silent and hangs glorious i think i hear it cry with an articulate voice i show you an image fair as alabaster emerging from the dim wave charlotte bronte knew well the experience of dreams she seems to have undergone the inevitable dream of mourners the human dream of the labyrinth shall i call it the uncertain spiritual journey in search of the waiting and sequestered dead which is the obscure subject of the eurydice of coventry patmore's odes there is the lately dead in exile remote betrayed foreign indifferent sad forsaken by some vague malice or neglect sought by troubled love astray in charlotte bronte's page there is an autumnal and tempestuous dream a nameless experience that had the hue the mien the terror the very tone of a visitation from eternity suffering brood in temporal or calculable measure tastes not as this suffering tasted finally is there any need to cite the passage of jane eyre that contains the avowal the vigil in the garden those are not words to be forgotten some tell you that a fine style will give you the memory of a scene and not of the recording words that are the author's means and others again would have the phrase to be remembered foremost here then in jane eyre are both memories equal the night is perceived the phrase is an experience both have their place in the reader's irrevocable past custom intervened between me and what i naturally and inevitably loved jane do you hear that nightingale singing in the wood a waft of wind came sweeping down the laurel walk and trembled through the boughs of the chestnut it wandered away to an infinite distance the nightingale's voice was then the only voice of the hour in listening i again wept whereas charlotte bronte walked with exaltation and enterprise upon the road of symbols under the guidance of her own visiting genius emily seldom went out upon those far avenues she was one who practised imagery sparingly her style had the key of an inner prose which seems to leave imagery behind in the way of approaches the apparelled and arrayed approaches and ritual of literature and so to go further and to be admitted among simple realities and antitypes charlotte bronte also knew that simple goal but she loved her imagery in the passage of jane eyre that tells of the return to thornfield hall in ruins by fire she bespeaks her reader's romantic attention to an image which in truth is not all golden she has moments on the other hand of pure narrative whereof each word is such a key as i spoke of but now and unlocks an inner and an inner plain door of spiritual realities there is perhaps no author who 
simply telling what happened tells it with so great a significance jane did you hear that nightingale singing in the wood and she made haste to leave us but her characteristic calling is to images those avenues and temples oracular and to the vision of symbols you may hear the poet of great imagery praised as a great mystic nevertheless although a great mystical poet makes images he does not do so in his greatest moments he is a great mystic because he has a full vision of the mystery of realities not because he has a clear invention of similitudes of many thousand kisses the poor last and now with his love now in the cold grave are lines on the yonder side of imagery so is this line also sad with the promise of a different sun and piteous passion keen at having found after exceeding ill a little good shakespeare chaucer and patmore yield us these great examples imagery is for the time when as in these lines the shock of feeling which must needs pass as the heart beats and pauses is gone by thy heart with dead-winged innocence filled even as a nest with birds after the old ones by the hawk are killed i cite these lines of patmore's because of their imagery in a poem that without them would be insupportably close to spiritual facts and because it seems to prove with what a yielding hand at play the poet of realities holds his symbols for a while a great writer is both a major and a minor mystic in the self-same poem now suddenly close to his mystery which is his greater moment and anon making it mysterious with imagery which is the moment of his most beautiful lines the student passes delighted through the several courts of poetry from the outer to the inner from riches to more imaginative riches and from decoration to more complex decoration and prepares himself for the greater opulence of the innermost chamber but when he crosses the last threshold he finds this midmost sanctuary to be a hypoethral temple and in its custody and care a simple earth and a space of sky emily bronte seems to have a nearly unparalleled unconsciousness of the delays the charms the pauses and preparations of imagery her strength does not dally with the parenthesis and her simplicity is ignorant of those rights her lesser work therefore is plain narrative and her greater work is no more on the hither side the daily side of imagery she is still a strong and solitary writer on the yonder side she has written some of the most mysterious passages in all plain prose and with what direct and incommunicable art let me alone let me alone said catherine if i've done wrong i'm dying for it you left me too i forgive you forgive me it is hard to forgive and to look at those eyes and feel those wasted hands he answered kiss me again and don't let me see your eyes i forgive what you have done to me i love my murderer but yours how can i they were silent their faces hid against each other and washed by each other's tears so much the worse for me that i am strong cries heathcliff in the same scene do i want to live what kind of living will it be when you oh god would you like to live with your soul in the grave charlotte bronte's noblest passages are her own speech or the speech of one like herself acting the central part in the dreams and dramas of emotion that she had kept from her girlhood the unavowed custom of the ordinary girl by her so splendidly avowed in a confidence that comprised the world emily had no such confessions to publish she contrived but the word does not befit her singular spirit of liberty that knew nothing of stealth to remove herself from the world as her person left no pen portrait so her eye is not heard here she lends her voice in disguise to her men and women the first narrator of her great romance is a young man the second a servant woman 
this one or that among the actors takes up the story and her great words sound at times in paltry mouths it is then that for a moment her reader seems about to come into her immediate presence but by a fiction she denies herself to him to a somewhat trivial girl or a girl who would be trivial in any other book but emily bronte seems unable to create anything consistently meagre to isabella lenton she commits one of her most memorable passages and one which has the rare image one of a terrifying little company of visions amid terrifying facts his attention was roused i saw for his eyes rained down tears among the ashes the clouded windows of hell flashed for a moment towards me the fiend which usually looked out was so dimmed and drowned but in heathcliff's own speech there is no veil or circumstance i'm too happy and yet i'm not happy enough my soul's bliss kills my body but does not satisfy itself i have to remind myself to breathe and almost to remind my heart to beat being alone and conscious two yards of loose earth was the sole barrier between us i said to myself i'll have her in my arms again if she be cold i'll think it is this north wind that chills me and if she be motionless it is sleep what art moreover what knowledge what a fresh ear for the clash of repetition what a chime in that phrase i dreamt i was sleeping the last sleep by that sleeper with my heart stopped and my cheek frozen against hers emily bronte was no student of books it was not from among the fruits of any other author's labor that she gathered these eminent words but i think i have found the suggestion of this action of heathcliff's the disinternment not in any inspiring ancient irish legend as has been suggested did emily bronte find her incident she found it but she made and did not find its beauty in a mere costume romance of bulwer lytton whom charlotte bronte as we know did not admire and emily showed no sign at all of admiration when she did him so much honor as to borrow the action of his studio bravo heathcliff's love for catherine's past childhood is one of the profound surprises of this unparalleled book it is to call her childish ghost the ghost of the little girl when she has been a dead adult woman twenty years that the inhuman lover opens the window of the house on the heights something is this that the reader knew not how to look for another thing known to genius and beyond a reader's hope is the tempestuous purity of those passions this wild quality of purity has a counterpart in the brief passages of nature that make the summers the waters the woods and the windy heights of that murderous story seem so sweet the beck that was audible beyond the hills after rain the heath on the top of wuthering heights whereon in her dream of heaven catherine flung out by angry angels awoke sobbing for joy the bird whose feathers she the lyrious creature plucks from the pillow of her death-bed this i should know it among a thousand it's a lapwing's bonny bird wheeling over our heads in the middle of the moor it wanted to get to its nest for the clouds had touched the swells and it felt rain coming the only two white spots of snow left on all the moors and the brooks brimful the old apple trees the smell of stalks and wallflowers in the brief summer the few fir trees by catherine's window bars the early moon i know not where are landscapes more exquisite and natural and among the signs of death where is any fresher than the window seen from the garden to be swinging open in the morning when heathcliff lay within dead and drenched with rain none of these things are presented by images nor is that signal passage wherewith the book comes to a close 
be it permitted to cite it here again it has taken its place it is among the paragons of our literature our language will not lapse or derogate while this prose stands for appeal i lingered under that benign sky watched the moths fluttering among the heath and harebells listened to the soft wind breathing through the grass and wondered how anyone could ever imagine unquiet slumbers for the sleepers in that quiet earth finally of emily bronte's face the world holds only an obviously unskilled reflection and of her aspect no record worth having wild fugitive she vanished she escaped she broke away exiled by the neglect of her contemporaries banished by their disrespect outlawed by their contempt dismissed by their indifference and such an one was she as might rather have pronounced upon these the sentence passed by coriolanus under sentence of expulsion she might have driven the world from before her face and cast it out from her presence as he condemned his romans i banish you End of chapter 4chapter five of hearts of controversy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. hearts of controversy by alice maynell charmian she is not cleopatra but she is at least charmian wrote keats conscious that his damsel was not in the vanward of the pageant of ladies one may divine that he counted the ways wherein she was not cleopatra the touches whereby she fell short of and differed from nay in which she mimicked the queen in like manner many of us have for some years past boasted of our appreciation of the inferior beauty the substitute the waiting gentlewoman of corrupt or corruptible heart keats confessed but did not boast it is a vaunt now an emulation who shall discover her beauty who shall discern her she is most conspicuous in the atmosphere in smoke effects in the lurid the mystery such are the perfervid words but let us take the natural and authentic light of our symbol of cleopatra her sprightly port her infinite jest her bluest vein her variety her lot o eastern star men in cities look upward not much more than animals and these except the dog when he bays the moon look skyward not at all the events of the sky do not come and go for the citizens do not visibly approach and withdraw threaten and pardon they merely happen and even when the sun so condescends as to face them at the level of their own horizon say upon the western end of bayswater road when he searches out the eyes that have neglected him all day finds a way between their narrowing lids looks straight into their unwelcoming pupils explores the careful wrinkles singles and numbers the dull hairs even i say to sudden sunset in our dim climate the londoner makes no reply he would rather look into puddles than into the pools of light among clouds yet the light is as characteristic of a country as is its landscape so that i would travel for the sake of a character of early morning for a quality of noonday or a tone of afternoon or an accident of moonrise or a colour of dusk and at least as far as for a mountain a cathedral rivers or men the light is more important than what it illuminates when mr tomkins a person of dickens earliest invention calls his fellow boarders from the breakfast-table to the window and with emotion shows them the effect of sunshine upon the left side of a neighbouring chimney-pot he is far from cutting the grotesque figure that the humorist intended to point out to banter 
i am not sure that the chimney-pot with the pure light upon it was not more beautiful than a whole black greek or a whole black gothic building in the unadulterated lights of a customary london day nor is the pleasure that many writers and a certain number of painters tell us they owe to such adulteration anything other than a sign of derogation in a word a pleasure in a secondary thing are we the better artists for our preference for the waiting woman it is a strange claim the search for the beauty of the less beautiful is a modern enterprise ingenious in its minor pranks insolent in its greater and its chief ignobility is the love of marred defiled disordered dulled and imperfect skies the skies of cities some will tell us that the unveiled light is too clear or sharp for art so much the worse for art but even on that plea the limitations of art are better respected by natural mist cloudy gloom of natural rain natural twilight before night or natural twilight corrows before a day than by the artificial dimness of our unlovely towns those too who praise the mystery of smoke are praising rather a mystification than a mystery and must be unaware of the profounder mysteries of light light is all mystery when you face the sun and every particle of the innumerable atmosphere carries its infinitesimal shadow moreover it is only in some parts of the world that we should ask for even natural veils in california we may not because the light is too luminous but because it is not tender clear and not tender in california tender and not clear in england light in italy and in greece is both tender and clear when one complains of the ill luck of modern utilities the sympathetic listener is apt to agree but to agree wrongly by denouncing the electric light as something modern to be deplored but the electric light is the one success of the last century it is never out of harmony with natural things villages ancient streets of cities where it makes the most beautiful of all street lighting swung from house to opposite house in genoa or rome with no shock except a shock of pleasure does the judicious traveller entering some small subalpine hamlet find the electric light fairly sparingly spaced slung from tree to tree over a little road and note it again in the frugal wine-shop and solitary and clear over the church portal yet forsooth if yielding to the suggestions of your restless hobby you denounce in any company the spoiling of your italy the hearer calling up a mumping visonomy thinks he echoes your complaint by his sigh ah yes the electric light you meet it everywhere now so modern so disenchanting it is on the contrary enchanting it is as natural as lightning by all means let all the waterfalls in all the alps be harnessed as the lamentation runs if their servitude gives us electric light for thus the power of the waterfall kindles a lovely lamp all this is done by the simple force of gravitation the powerful fall of water wonderful all that water coming down cried the tourist at niagara and the irishman said why wouldn't it he recognized the simplicity of that power it is a second-rate passion that for the waterfall and often exacting in regard to visitors from town i trudged unwillingly said dr johnson and was not sorry to find it dry it was very very second-rate of an american admirer of scenery to name a waterfall in the yosemite valley and it bears the name to-day the bridal veil his indian predecessor had called it because it was most audible in menacing weather the voice of the evil wind in fact your cascade is dearer to every sentimentalist than the sky 
standing near the folding over place of niagara at the top of the fall i looked across the perpetual rainbow of the foam and saw the whole further sky deflowered by the formless edgeless languid abhorrent murk of smoke from the nearest town much rather would i see that water put to use than the sky so outraged as it is only by picking one's way between cities can one walk under or as it were in a pure sky the horizon in venice is thick and ochreous and no one cares the sky of milan is defiled all round in england i must choose a path alertly and so does now and then a wary fortunate fastidious wind that has so found this exact uncharted way between this smoke and that as to clear me a clean moonrise and heavenly heavens there was an ominous prophecy to charmian you shall outlive the lady whom you serve she has outlived her in every city in europe but only for the time of setting straight her crown the last civility she could not live but by comparison with the queen end of chapter five recording by alan mapstone in oxford england chapter six of hearts of controversy this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Hearts of Controversy by Alice Maynell. The Century of Moderation. After a long literary revolt, one of the recurrences of imperishable romance, against the 18th century authors, a reaction was due, and it has come about roundly we are guided back to admiration of the measure and moderation and shapeliness of the augustan age and indeed it is well enough that we should compare not necessarily check some of our habits of thought and verse by the mediocrity of thought and perfect propriety of diction of pope's best contemporaries if this were all but the eighteenth century was not content with its sure and certain genius suddenly and repeatedly it aspired to a noble rage it is not to the wild light hearts of the seventeenth century that we must look for extreme conceits and for extravagance but to the later age to the faultless to the frigid dissatisfied with their own propriety there were straws i confess in the hair of the older poets the eighteenth century men stuck straws in their periwigs that time surpassing and correcting the century then just past in taste was resolved to make a low leg to no age antique or modern in the chapter of the passions nay to show the way to fire the nations addison taught himself as his hero taught the doubtful battle where to rage and in the later years of the same literary century johnson himself summoned the lapsed and alien and reluctant fury take such a word as matted the matted land there indeed is a word created for the noble rage as the eighteenth century understood it look you johnson himself could lodge the fury in his responsible breast a dubious title shakes the matted land there is no author of that time of moderation and good sense who does not thus more or less eat a crocodile it is not necessary to go to the bad poets we need go no lower than the good and gasping furies thrust their blood in vain says pope seriously but the sense of burlesque never leaves the reader also there purple vengeance bathed in gore retires in the only passage of the dunciad meant to be poetic and not ironic and spiteful he has the panting gales of a garden he describes match me such an absurdity among the conceits of the age preceding a noble and ingenious author so called by high authority but left anonymous pretends it is always worth pretending with these people never find fiction or a frank lie that on the tomb of virgil he had had a vision of that deceased poet 
crowned with eternal bays my ravished eyes beheld the poet's awful form arise virgil tells the noble and genius one that if pope will but write upon some graver themes envy to black cockatus shall retire and howl with furies in tormenting fire genius says another authoritative writer in prose is caused by a furious joy and pride of soul if leaving the great names we pass in review the worst poets we find in pope's essay on the art of sinking in poetry things like these gathered from the grave writings of his contemporaries in flaming heaps the raging ocean rolls whose livid waves involve despairing souls the liquid burnings dreadful colors show some deeply red and others faintly blue and a war-horse his eyeballs burn he wounds the smoking play and knots of scarlet ribbon deck his mane and a demon provoking demons all restraint remove here is more eighteenth century propriety the hills forget their fixed and in their fright cast off their weight and ease themselves for flight the woods with terror winged outfly the wind and leave the heavy panting hills behind and again from nat lee's alexander the great when glory like the dazzling eagle stood perched on my beaver in the granite flood when fortune's self my standard trembling bore and the pale fate stood frighted on the shore of these lines with another couplet dr warburton said that they contain not only the most sublime but the most judicious imagery that poetry could conceive or paint and here are lines from a tragedy for me anonymous should the fierce north upon his frozen wings bear him aloft above the wandering clouds and seat him in the pleiad's golden chariot thence should my fury drag him down to tortures again kiss while i watch thy swimming eyeballs roll watch thy last gasp and catch thy springing soul it was the age of common sense we are told and truly but of common sense now and then dissatisfied common sense here and there ambitious common sense of a distinctively adult kind taking on an innocent tone i find this little affectation in pope's word sky where a simpler poet would have skies or heavens pope has sky more than once and always with a little false air of simplicity and in one instance occurs in that masterly and most beautiful poem the elegy on an unfortunate lady is there no bright reversion in the sky yes my boy we may hope so is the reader's implicit mental aside if the reader be a man of humour let me however suggest no disrespect towards this lovely elegy of which the last eight lines have an inimitable greatness a tenderness and passion which the epistle of eloisa makes convulsive movements to attain but never attains and yet how could one by an example place the splendid seventeenth century in closer in slighter yet more significant comparison with the eighteenth than thus here is ben jonson what beckoning ghost besprent with april dew hails me so solemnly to yonder you and this is pope's improvement what beckoning ghost along the moonlight shade invites my steps and points to yonder glade but pope follows this insipid couplet with two lines as exquisitely and nobly modulated as anything i know in that national metre tis she but why that bleeding blossom gored why dimly gleams the visionary sword that indeed is music in english verse the counterpart of a great melody not of a tune the eighteenth century matched its desire for wildness in poetry with a light craving in gardens the symmetrical and architectural garden so magnificent in italy and stately though more rigid and less glorious in france was scorned by the eighteenth century poet gardeners why because it was artificial and the eighteenth century must have nature nay passion there seems to be some plan of passion in pope's grotto stuck with spar and little shells 
truly the age of the rape of the lock and the elegy was an age of great wit and great poetry yet it was untrue to itself i think no other century has cherished so persistent a self-conscious incongruity as the century of good sense and good couplets it might have kept uncompromised the dignity we honor but such inappropriate pranks have come to pass in history now and again the bishop of hereford in mary barnsdale danced in his boots but he was coerced by robin hood end of chapter six end of hearts of controversy by alice Maynell.